Hello, hi everyone. Welcome to the new normal of the Davos Agenda. And in this session, we'll be talking about designing connected and sustainable value chains. Don't go anywhere because I have a multinational um, members of the panel who are very much interested to speak about this topic. So welcome everyone. And I would like to introduce myself. My name is Kamaro. I'm right here talking to you from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And my first uh, person on the panel, I would like to introduce Stefan Doboski, the Chief Executive Officer of Lensing Group. And then uh, we also have Dipali Goenka, the Chief Executive Officer and Joint MD or Managing Director of Wellspun from India. Thank you so much, very colorful Dipali for joining us. And then we have Levan Sakiroglu, the Chief Executive Officer of Coach Holding from Turkey. Thank you so very much, Levan, for joining us. And then we also have Orit Gadish, the Chairman of Bain and Company. Nice to see you, Orit. You are moderator yourself. I hope you will help me in this session. We're going to have a very, very cool one. So we have what we have. People are saying 2020, they're glad to get rid of it. But the CEOs and people in the value chain knows that, hey, we are still carrying part of 2020 into 2021. What about the value chains from public health? We saw how is it that people are scrambling to distribute for people who can afford vaccine of COVID-19. And in my own country, there's a lot of things that we used to enjoy because of free trade, but now the containers are not moving that much, the air cargo are not moving that much, and certain products and services are not around. So I'm going to start with this question. Maybe um, we'll let the ladies speak first. Maybe Deepali, if you can help us. Uh, how was 2020 for you and your company? What was the thing that struck the most during the COVID-19 new normal uh, environment and how is your company doing now, Deepali? So um, when 2020 struck uh, March 21st, India just went for a lockdown. And um, for a month, our factories were shut down. And uh, we have 20,000 people. Uh, we were really worried about them. Uh, there was no business, no trickle of any kind of trade happening. Um, Come 21 April, that's the time our work started. The important thing which I just wanted to lay on the table for everybody is that what we did as an organization, we first focused on our people. We first focused on our people, their health, saw that they were safe, saw that you know, uh, you know, we created an app which could socially distance them, there could be geofencing. Um, secondly, as the businesses started coming in, we started looking at our supply chains. Uh, with us at Wellspun, with the workers' colonies and everything in close proximity, that was easy. And we'd already taken care of our health and safety of our people. Uh, our supply chains, we keep cotton for the you know, six months and seven months. That helped us to mobilize that. Apart from that, um, the important thing was that we also have an ancillary park of our vendors. So it is just a kilometer away. So that also started uh, chugging along. Um, so I think the whole aspect of saying that, you know, uh, the important thing and a learning for us has been collaboration, partnership, digitization, and care. That is where I'll sum it, actually, Kamarul. I'll just keep okay. it shorter. Yeah. Thank you so much, Deepali. Stefan, if you can weave in, because I know you've been looking at digitalization and also supply chain across the world. But how has the new normal impacted you guys? Um, for us, 2020 was an, um, as much as an extraordinary year as I think for, for many um, here on the panel, but I think also on those listening in. Um, in essence, I think we were facing two interesting challenges slash opportunities. The one is just actually how do we keep our business running? And I think this was similar to others. At the same time, we noticed that particularly in the first phase, um, we had to grow beyond our typical responsibilities. We actually needed to support our country just in helping to provide things that due to the interruption of supply chains were just in short supply. For example, face masks. Um, we were helping the Austrian government, our local government, just to source 
the same time we experienced how difficult, even with our network in China, it became to do that. So consequently, we decided to step into production. So we started during the lockdown, a new kind of business, just as a response um, to the crisis, at the same time showing our people that if we actually take supply chain serious and make sure that we can provide what in this case the country needs, we create a sense of ent entrepreneurship in the company that I think just served as a source of inspiration. On the other hand, and maybe we'll come back later in the discussion, we felt that in the course of 2020, things that were already critical before did not go away, and that's sustainability. And maybe that is a second um, notion and later on of the discussion, what actually needs to be done in order to bring the notion of sustainability to the consumer and how critical supply chains are in this context. Yeah. Yeah. So Stefan moved into a new uh, business to help. Uh, in Malaysia, I know we have the biggest latex and nitrile glove manufacturers, but suddenly we have many more companies, not just the usual because of that demand. But Levant, um, Coach Holding looks at multiple areas of business and industries. So if you can take up one anecdotal you know, experience from 2020 and how that has really helped you in 2021. Uh, thank you. 2020 was a year with dynamics that we had never experienced before. And uh, speaking of value chains, I would like to emphasize that at the center of the value chain is your company. In order to deal with the challenges in the supply chain and the distribution, your company must be strong and healthy. For that, uh, the people, first, as Deepali uh, emphasized, must be uh, healthy. The well-being of uh, them was the uh, priority. Second, the balance sheet, liquidity, and the cash flow of the company uh, must be healthy. Uh, prioritizing uh, our workforce, uh, in our case, uh, 100,000 uh, colleagues all around the world was the utmost importance, and we took all the necessary measures uh, to support them uh, and uh, the measures to protect them when uh, we uh, operate uh, our businesses. Uh, making the balance sheets healthy is not possible over time. It requires long-term uh, disciplined uh, execution. And uh, as uh, you suggested, Coach Group is a, a multi-sector uh, conglomerate. We have operations in automotive, home appliances, uh, energy, banking, tourism, retail, and multi-manufacturing uh, facilities in Turkey, Romania, Russia, South Africa, China, Thailand, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And the complexity, as you can imagine, is already inherent in our business uh, portfolio. And COVID-19 has put uh, an impact uh, on uh, those different businesses in, uh, to a different extent. I can give you some examples, but uh, I, I uh, would like to uh, add this point that, uh, for example, in automotive, our factories uh, didn't shut down uh, due to the disruptions uh, in the supply chain. However, uh, we had to close our factories uh, because of the lack of demand in our uh, major markets. In home appliances, demand was relatively uh, stable. However, we had to shut down the factories due to the lockdowns in certain uh, countries. Du during those times, uh, lockdown times in the yeah. uh, automotive factories, uh, our colleagues uh, were able to uh, produce uh, face masks, uh, masks uh, face shields, intubation uh, cabins, and uh, another uh, important uh, development was uh, that our appliances company, Archedic, uh, manufactured, produced uh, a mechanical ventilator, which was very much needed all around the world in collaboration with uh, three other companies in a very short period of time. Oris, if I can, uh, Oris, if I can quickly go to you, um, you know, people first. Tipali has said that, and so uh, 
So the, the other CEO said that the cash flow business needs to still uh, go on and, you know, you need to reap revenue coming in. Anything else that you can see or, is, or it, that you can, you know, talk across the companies that has done well from 2020 coming into 2021? Thank you. Um, let me start actually by saying what we learned from 2020 with regard to things that I think will be permanent for the future. People always come first, but let me focus on supply of value chain. And to start with, consistent with what has been discussed, I think it's clear that old conventions regarding value chains have changed. It will no longer be enough to just optimize for efficiency and reliability. If 2020 taught us anything, it's that in a world with trade wars, extreme climate events, and possible future pandemics, none of those things are going away. Sustainability and resilience must enter into our planning. Now, we used to live in a world in which responsibilities began when we purchased input and ended when we sold products. That's no longer the case. Resilience and sustainability require that we expand our field of vision. We expand it back to raw materials and forward to after product consumptions, including packaging and waste and the environmental cost of transportation. As a result, companies must redefine and redesign the way they think about value chain. And what do I mean by that? And we've worked with many companies on these things. First, recognizing that sustainability and resilience require both visibility, data on what's happening, and traceability, following the path and process of every input beyond tier one suppliers. It means evolving the organizational model from functional silos with perhaps a sustainability officer to one where R&D, manufacturing, marketing, and sustainability teams work closely together. It means thinking of sustainability as the new digital. It's not an afterthought. It's not incremental. It's a revolution, just like digital was 15 years ago. This is the time for a disrupt or be disrupted mindset. And like all revolutions, it has to be led from the top. It has to be priority for CEOs. Regarding the how, there are a few important lessons as well. And again, I'll combine resilience with sustainability. One, start small but start. Start and expand later. Pick a pain point and develop a feasible use case. Walmart had a need for real-time visibility all the way back to the farm, following an E. coli hybrid in its uh, fresh produce. So it developed Food Trust with IBM to trace the entire supply chain of its produce and then moved to other product categories. Two, collaboration is essential, and a number of people mentioned that. Your entire supply chain may not be a meaningful portion of a major market, and the cost to go it alone may be too much. So you need collaboration both upstream and downstream. Food Trust, still managed by IBM, now has over 50 participants, both major competitors of Walmart and suppliers. Three, help small suppliers. Recognize that many suppliers may not have the resources or the skills to join a program, especially from developing countries, but not only. Four, good relevant data and technology choice are the foundation. We can only hope to truly understand our impact once we accurately know where inputs come from and products end up. Five, with collaboration, rules for proactive data governance are critical. Partners worry about sharing data, and that's understandable. So safeguards, data permissions, data governance, they all must be determined up front to build trust. This, by the way, is where public-private partnerships can, rely, can really help if we get to talk about it. And finally, First movers reap benefits, and not just in terms of public relations. It's better to have established an industry standard and remain its custodian than to have that standard imposed on you by other than supply chain, by competitors, or by regulation. So be the convener if you can. I'm going to go to Deepali uh, based on what Orit said. Uh, Deepali, you know, your company looks at textile, so, you know, um, um, if, if uh, looking across uh, the supply chain, and we... The pandemic has shown that we are only as strong as the weakest link. And a lot of people, when they look at value chain, sometimes they forget the producers, the farmers. And when I look at India, it's never more. They know the threat of a uh, pandemic, but they have to gather and show their voices because they don't think that they are represented well. So Orit has said that, but how start? You know, you have to start. That's what Orit says. But... Uh, how do you move the whole of the supply chain, including at the very grassroots, for them to buy into the change 
and the revolution that you want to do, Dipali? So, Kamarul, I think um, I think I totally resonate what uh, what Orit said, and I mean, I think sustainability, and I think the farmers. For us, I think how much I mean it resonates the most because we are, uh, you know, for us it is farm to shelf at Wells Fund. So, working with the farmers uh, for the better cotton initiatives at the farms in India uh, to see the better living conditions, to see that you know they can uh, they can retain and sustain the whole supply chain is very very integral to what we do. Um, I think it is all governed by sustainability as well in the terms that what we do at Wells Fund uh, come rule in the terms of, uh, um, you know, um, uh, the water. I mean, at Wells Fund's facility, we don't even use a drop of fresh water. Mm-hmm. And uh, being textile is the biggest polluter because in the land, you know, you, you have the landfills um, yes. uh, with, with fabric. So I think for us, I think uh, the important aspect of sustainability is all about circularity. Our story yeah. starts from the scrapyard of our uh, factories. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, cotton is a very important bit. And I yes. think for us, I think we survived um, the challenge is to take our communities together, our vendors together, because let's not forget in India, our backbone is our MSMEs, you know, uh, which are our small vendor communities, which we need to okay. take together. And our people, I think uh, one thing, Kamru, that I, I mean, I have learned in the pandemic is about training our people and skilling our people. Digitization will be the way forward for us as we go forward. So I think even in the factories about Industry 4.2, uh, AI and virtual reality, I think will be the way forward. I can I can just give a little example there, uh, Kamrul. We, we basically uh, created virtual showrooms for our customers, curated walkthroughs, okay. virtual, uh, virtual uh, quality inspections. Um, and I think, uh, and I think that's and uh, that's actually really uh, took us through this uh, come rule. And yeah. the important thing is to take your communities and your people uh, together. Yes. I think that's yeah. what I would put forward. Yeah, Stefan, if I can cross over to you, Stefan, um, wouldn't it be great with digitization and digitalization if we know for a fact that any single fiber of anything that I'm buying or using doesn't uh, do any harm to either planet or people? Uh, if I know that if it's come from India, but it's from uh, the group of community that the farmers are supported and their families are supported, for example. So, I mean, that's just from the consumer side. But from your side, from managing the whole supply chain, how do you look at making transparency through digitalization more and more an advantage uh, as regards to being very transparent with the stakeholders? Now, let me paint a little bit the challenge that I think the same industry that was mentioned before is facing. The, the textile industry at large is around 10% of global CO2 emissions. It's 148 million tons of waste every year. And contrary to many other industries, there is no recycling concept within textiles. Now, the challenge is that this is one of the most complex supply chain of all industries because you have many small farmers, you have very small mom and pop shops in spinning um, and textile manufacturing at large. And by now it has reached the consumer that he wants to make a responsible choice, but he doesn't know what it means. He doesn't know what it means. So the challenge for a company like ours that just takes CO2 or the trees take CO2 and return it into fibers that end up then into biodegradable and compostable um, products is how do we actually convince the brand, that there is value behind it, and help the consumer to make an educated choice. Let let me make you, um, more or less, to build on the example before, moving early how important it is. We started with a blockchain initiative within our company, but we soon found out that if we as lensing were to do that, that will not fly. Because transparency also, in terms of data, requires trust. If you're the owner of data of your supply chain, you will not be trusted. So we asked the inventor to make his own company. You know, he moved to India, built up a whole um, um, tech company around that. And by now, we have some good 200 value chain partners on it, and we connect the tree with the consumer. The consumer can actually not only get our fiber, but he gets a digital token which in the end allows him to be sure that it wasn't you know, an, a, a transparent move of our fiber to him. Because for us as lensing, one of the big challenges is we're getting faked 
our brand, Tencel, which is one of the most well-known ingredient brands, get as much faked as a Chanel, as a Louis Vuitton and the like. And that's a big challenge for our, for our concept. So in essence, our approach is make it all transparent, convince the brands that they need to want this and force the value chain from their end. And by doing that, we get okay. a sustainable and a traceable value chain. Understood. Uh, Levan, I want to steal one more point from Orit just now, which is about how crucial partnership and corroborations are. For example, I know that you said that in the automotive sector, there's lower demand for cars. But in Malaysia, for example, one of the relief and stimulus packages released by the government is to stop or you know, not charge taxes for the buying of new cars, for example. So our car volume in Malaysia, the sales has gone up. But um, so collaboration across markets, collaboration across value chain to make up for what is being shortened by the remedial action taken for COVID-19. Do you see that happening within your group, Levan? You have to unmute. Yep. You're still on mute. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I actually, uh, in, in our case, uh, we, we have experienced different dynamics in uh, different markets. Uh, I mentioned that in our major markets, uh, the demand uh, declined in automotive. However, uh, in Turkey, uh, due to the uh, stimulus uh, activities of the government, the banks started lending heavily. Uh, that has supported the demand in automotive, uh, where uh, we need to, to act very quickly to respond to that demand. There comes the solidarity, which I touched base earlier. Uh, we, at the beginning, we didn't panic. Uh, we were determined uh, to protect the employment and the well, financial well-being of our employees. And when we needed them uh, to work overtime or postpone uh, their holidays, they were re ready uh, to show that uh, solidarity. And we were able to uh, respond to the uh, spike in the uh, demand in, uh, uh, in the domestic market. And that is thanks to our smart factories at the center of this supply or value chain is our smart factories and two of our factories uh, were already recognized uh, by world economic forum as lighthouse factories and we have been trying to make the entire value chain as transparent as possible it's one of the ways to overcome the problems especially uh, during volatile volatile uh, periods which has paid off again. However, uh, I believe uh, still the companies are at very early stages to connect the entire value chain end to end uh, for seamless data uh, flow. Uh, and I, 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 I think it is uh, one of the subjects that we, uh, all the industries, uh, industries should work uh, with their uh, uh, suppliers. Ori, if I can go back to you, um, taking the example of my own country, Malaysia, this is our second lockdown after the first one uh, months ago. And in the lockdown, many businesses and manufacturing uh, supply chain also cannot continue. But this time around, the government has identified a few industries where the workers are allowed. Taking your example, if they make the move now, if companies invest in digitization and digitalization, not just for their value chain, but also for the whole of their employees. So if that database can be shared public-private partnership with the authorities, so it doesn't have to be a hard lockdown because uh, companies can monitor the health of their own workers and they can create their own green bubble that can be shared with the authority. So in Malaysia, we're trying to balance between public health and opening up the economy and finding the balance. But digitalization sort of gives the innovation side of making this more doable rather than not. Ori. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, 
digitization uh, in terms of helping the employees is always an important thing to do. And we've actually been talking about it sort of collectively, people have, for the last four or five years. It just became a lot more urgent uh, in the last year and definitely in places where it might have been less developed. But the whole issue of technology goes, when we talk about value chain, go really beyond just the ability of a third party to understand what's going on there. It goes to your ability to actually trace everything that you're doing by joining forces with suppliers, such as many in Europe. And, and in many cases, it really will need a third party. In the case I described, it was IBM, who has a completely separate, in their case, it's a blockchain, uh, ability to actually connect not just people like Walmart and a lot of their uh, suppliers, but also a lot of competitors who wouldn't naturally combine together or partner together if they didn't have the ability. Like blockchain obviously gives you further ability to make sure that the only data that people need to see gets is seen and, and the data permissions are there, but it's also a third party that gives us validity. It can be a government, it can be a regulation, a regulatory body, it can be bodies that are there to certify things, and there are quite a number of people who certify, therefore they have already a lot of insight and visibility into what suppliers like the ones you mentioned. Um, but, you know, I, uh, Christine Lagarde yesterday said that at least Europe has jumped in terms of digitization and ability to, do, uh, to uh, mm -hmm. be digital by seven years. I think that is true for almost every place. So more innovations like the ones you are talking about yeah. uh, are probably possible and should probably get started. Ori, uh, towards the end of the first half an hour, I would like you to kickstart this round by asking you this question. We've heard what President Xi Jinping uh, said. He calls and he mentions about, you know, partnership, about working together, about a more, more multilateral world. Now that we've got a new president in the White House, we've heard what the president of China has said. Do you have a bit more optimism of there will be, lack of better term, green bubbles for supply chains to really move more and kickstart the economy even more in 2021? In between Singapore and Malaysia, for example, the government has agreed to reciprocal green lanes where the border is shut, but for certain economic activities, there are movement of people and goods. Imagine if that kind of green bubble can be worked around the world. What do you think about that, Ori? I think, I think it's a brilliant idea. We now have a president who just put the United States back into the Paris Agreement. He's well known about his, uh, his thoughtfulness and his, uh, his campaign for the kind of things you're talking about. And I think because of his attitude towards cooperation, which he has talked about, uh, not blind cooperation, but cooperation with yeah. institutes that are valid to, for everybody to join. Uh, I think that uh, that has become more and more real. And if President Xi, uh, we, we depend a lot on China when it comes to greening the world. Yeah. Yeah. If we can cooperate with him on that, I right. think that's yeah. excellent forward. Stefan, your optimism or not on that, you know, a green bubble for value chains around the world? I'm very optimistic because the consumer wants it. The consumer wants it, and as a consequence, it's a business opportunity. And the more I think we're able to shift to actually communicating what we're doing to the, cons to the consumer, make him um, aware about your company, about your brands, and what stands behind that, I think the more it will, in the end, be a, just a commercial discussion rather than an ESG per se discussion. And I think the more we do that, the more we force the ESG topics into one direction. And I think a lot of common sense brings us very far. Let's just not wait for too long until all the you know, ducks are in the rows and you know, everybody aligned just get moving. Because I cannot, uh, from my own experience, it just takes so much time that yeah. whatever day you're not doing it, you just lose. Deepali, you want that as fast as possible in India too. But a green bubble around the world for value chain, Deepali. I think it's a whole, whole um, I'm totally with it. Um, and I feel um, uh, from the blockchain to the end, till the consumer, uh, the whole supply chain in entirety. I mean, I could start from the farms to uh, attract the transparency to our uh, factories, to see the whole sustainability to our uh, 
people our communities um mm-hmm. and the whole supply chain till the end till the customers um virtual shelves i think it is uh, it's definitely uh, and there's there are huge opportunities for green bubble here and of course the consumers are talking about transparency now at the provenance so it is a big opportunity and we are talking with the millennials and the gen z they all aware about what right. uh, sustainability means to them levan your final say for the first 30 minutes on this oh, uh, I, it, it, it is it is uh, one of the most important subjects in in our agendas uh, consumers want that uh, our uh, employees want that investors want that and all the company uh, management uh, want that and there is an opportunity uh, to create a, the business model uh, based uh, on uh, the green initiatives and uh, also the government initiatives including the green deal by the european union uh, will force the supply chains to uh, change the architecture to cope up uh, with the uh, regulations we will have to achieve it in order to have a sustainable businesses Correct. at the first place yeah many stakeholders have to come together for that but that's the first 30 minutes of this discussion on designing connected and sustainable value chain for those who are with us on top link stay on for those of you who are outside top link like from astro one universe audiences and everyone else thank you so much for joining us and for those in top link stay tuned we're going to come back right after this